We've had some fabulous talks. Uh, Jerry Corsi did a great job on uh, his topic, but I wanted to uh, just comment on an additional thing. This is a picture of the Majlis two years ago in October, voting on their nuclear program. We've had occasion to mention this, but there's some aspects of it that I'll briefly comment that I think you need to be aware of. When they voted on their nuclear program, 247 of the 290 members of their parliament equivalent voted for the nuclear program by standing and shouting, death to the United States, death to Israel. I think the order is interesting. They regard hitting the U.S. as a prerequisite to hitting Israel, and for lots of practical and perhaps philosophical reasons. Now, we need to understand that the threat of a nuclear attack on the United States is an inevitability, according to the Department of Homeland Security. Americans should prepare for the inevitability of a nuclear event sometime in the future. Now, we go through a lot more quotes, but that will suffice for tonight. So it's a question of when, not if. And that's not me saying that. That's our Department of Homeland Security. And incidentally, I happen to know from our own network that the number one priority within the Department of Homeland Security, among all the different threats they're facing, is the threat of an electromagnetic pulse attack. So I wanted to touch upon that because I think you need to be briefed on what that is. Electromagnetic pulse. The abbreviation is EMP. You know, there's no explaining engineers. They take a two-word thing and make a three-letter acronym out of it. <laughs> Electromagnetic is one word. But the commonly accepted abbreviation is EMP. It turns out we really, the, the process was discovered back in 1925, the Compton Effect, but we didn't really experience it until 1962. We had a series of nuclear tests in the South Pacific, and one of the series was called the Starfish Detonation. A 1.4 megaton weapon was detonated 400 kilometers above Johnston Island. Almost 1,000 miles away, streetlights were blown out, alarms tripped, and there was damage to telecommunications. And that shocked us. It took us a while to understand what was going on. Navigation was interrupted for 18 hours in, in Australia. We didn't explain to them then what happened. That came later. <laughs> the Soviets were doing tests, high-altitude tests also, and they discovered the same thing. In fact, they had power lines that were buried that got damaged. And that's what led to the mutual agreement between the U.S. and the USSR to not do any more high-altitude tests. It turns out that a, a high-energy bomb that high causes an effect that creates a very, in, among other things, a very intense magnetic pulse. So a commission was impaneled by the Congress to assess the threat to the United States of an EMP attack, electromagnetic pulse attack. That commission had our nine top scientists that are relevant to the E-ring of the Pentagon. Bill Graham himself chaired it, and I've had a chance to chat with him about all of this. Lowell Wood, the whole gang you read on the screen, Forrester, uh, Bob Herman at Naval Academy, and the rest of the gang. The whole gang is well known to anyone that's on the cutting edge of physics. These are our Dr. Tellers of today, if you will. They published their report in July of 2004. That is the same month it happened that the 911 Commission published this report, and that's, of course, what the press jumped on. But this report is on the Internet. You can Google it and find it. I encourage you to read it. It describes the conclusion of the scientists regarding our vulnerability to EMP and the disturbing discovery to everyone, including to the Department of Defense, was it is more of a disaster than anyone could have imagined. Because what really happens, if you take the United States, and if you, can, if you somehow could launch a very high altitude thermonuclear device of a megaton or so, in the center of the United States, that electromagnetic pulse would virtually reach coast to coast. And it would burn or fry 
most of the circuits, maybe not all of them, but practically all of them, that are attached to any kind of a long wire. It doesn't disable them for a while. It burns them, fries them. So you would be without telecommunications, which means you're without power and water and sanitation, especially in the big cities. Think about it. Bill Graham's assessment of the total picture is it would plunge the United States into, back to the 19th century. Think about how vulnerable we are to microcircuits. Anything you've purchased in a store that costs more than $1,000 and has a plug on the end of it has got circuits in it. And much smaller these days, too. So you need to realize it's a very, very serious threat. Now, um, if you were an adversary of the United States and you got your hands on a thermonuclear warhead, what would you do with it? Park in a truck in midtown Manhattan? That would make a statement. That's second best, so to speak. What you really want to do is do this. You, you really disable the United States more than it would from any direct, other specific direct hit. In fact, let me give you an alternate scenario. Let's assume you put a warhead on a standard off-the-shelf Sahab 3 medium-range ballistic missile, put it in a container on a container ship, and you've got that ship, an unmarked container ship, coming to the eastern seaboard, and when you get about, you don't have to get any closer than, say, a couple of hundred miles away, you're still in international waters, and you fire your Sahab 3 from that container ship, and you don't make it to the middle of the United States. You might make it to, let's just pick Indianapolis. You don't care about accuracy. All you want is altitude. And you go ahead and you detonate your warhead. Now, to give you a perspective of this, let's take a look at the United States at night. That gives you a feeling of the population density. You would wipe out the infrastructure for 70% of the U.S. population. No law enforcement. At Katrina, we discovered that it only takes hours for the looters to start. You also discovered you can't pump gas out of a gas station if there's no power to pump it. How do you send an ambulance downtown if there's gridlock because the signals aren't working? you begin to realize the infrastructure cascading would be disastrous. So it's a very serious concern, especially since Jane's out of London, Jane's, as you probably know, is one of the primary military publishers for over a century. Their intelligence people have reported that on the Caspian Sea, Iran is firing Sahab 3s from container ships and detonating them at altitude. Not nukes, just, they're just practicing. James's conclusion is they are practicing an EMP attack. So you begin to realize this race for nuclear capability by Iran is not only a threat to Israel. The shocking discovery of the Congressional Committee to assess this is that the United States is a one-bomb target. We've heard that alluded to as a descriptor of Tel Aviv. I just, you, we need to understand these things are serious, which means, of course, we can't let this happen. Whatever cards have to be played will be played to prevent that, one would hope. We had a wonderful discussion the day before the conference by Jerry Corsi on the NAFTA highway and all of that, how uh, this Chinese-controlled communication channel is being done, and, if, and I won't try to recap that whole thing, but... If you're not aware of this, I encourage you to get his book, The Late Great USA, because it's all documented, and you really want the document to check it out. So, Lazaro Cardenas is the southern tip of this. It's being upgraded by Walmart and the and Hutchison Wampoa, the Chinese company that controls uh, both ends of the Panama Canal, et cetera, et cetera. The RFID chip sensors throughout the highway are being built by Savi Limited, which is a joint venture between Lockheed Martin and guess who? China. So on it goes. Kansas City's super port is the electronic port that will be considered Mexican territory, but the trucks don't have to stop there. They're passed through all the way through electronically. So that should give joy to the, let's say bootleggers, what's the term I want? The smugglers. The smugglers. Okay, let me talk about a different topic just briefly. This is not the main thrust, but I wanted to highlight a few things because I, I was really concerned. I thought you, some of you might still be able to sleep tonight. I wanted to add just a few <laughs> things on there. You've heard allusions made to the U.S. debt debacle 
and this is one that all of us I need to be aware of, uh, President Bush and the Congress have together authorized and borrowed more money from foreign governments and, and banks and companies and citizens, more than all the 42 administrations in the history of this country. The, uh, from 1776 to the year 2000, that's the first 224 years of our history, 42 U.S. presidents borrowed a combined $1.01 trillion from various foreign governments and financial institutions. This is according, these are treasury figures. In the past four years alone, the Bush administration has borrowed $1.05 trillion. Now, it's a little misleading because inflation has not been corrected here, but you get the picture, okay? Now, I want to talk a little bit about our trade balance. We buy more than we sell. We always have, and that is not a long-term strategy. We finance our purchases, thus, with debt. You're buying more than you're selling, so you've got to borrow the difference, right? Our current imbalance is very substantial. Let me show it to you graphically. This is a map of our trade deficit. And in the uh, early 1990s, it was approaching $100 billion per year negative. Nothing to be proud of, but modest compared to what followed. From about 1997 to about the year 2000, it grew to four times as bad, over $400 billion negative per year. This is per year, gang, not cumulative. After 2001, 2001 it has been going worse until from 2005, we're virtually, well, we're over $900 billion, virtually a trillion dollars per year digging yourselves up. You know, the first law of holes is to stop digging. Let's change the subject and talk about the government. That was the total economy. Let's talk about the federal government. Our government spends more than it takes in in taxes, so we, they have to borrow. The Treasury has to borrow about 248, call it 250, billion per year to cover that. But the trade deficit is 850 growing, so that's over a trillion one. That means the Treasury has to find a way to borrow from foreigners. $3 billion per day. And foreign bankers are getting less willing to do that. So I'm, it's going to be very, very dicey to see what's coming. I believe, personally, they'll scotch tape this together through the election, but whoever walks into that Oval Office is going to walk into a buzzsaw. Let's, uh, we've talked about the general economy. We've talked about the government. Let's talk about the consumer. One of the most shocking things, look at this is the mortgage debt, and to put, make a long story short, it's grown to approximate the federal debt. And no wonder things are starting to break loose, and mortgage foreclosures are beginning to escalate. You all know that. You've been following the, the, the things. Let's see what the, I want to show you something from the official report of the U.S. Treasury that was fought, the annual report fired, filed December 15th of 2006. They said the federal budget deficit was $4.6 trillion, not the previously reported $248 um, billion. In other words, they're six times wrong there, but that's okay. The difference is the typical Treasury Department reports is on a cash basis. Well, the figures are on a cash basis all the way through. When they, at the end, they restate it in terms of the generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP as they call it, G-A-A-P. When, that, inc that includes the accruals. Social Security, Medicaid, medical, and so on. And so this report showed that the gap accounted negative net worth of the federal government increased 53, to $53.1 trillion, while the total federal obligations under gap are 54.6, taking into account the present value of future Social Security, Medicare liabilities. Get this. This, this, this is these wor their words. Put simply, the 2006 financial report of the United States shows that the arguments that the U.S. government is bankrupt have increasing merit. This is not a critic speaking. This is the U.S. Treasury report. They're, they're technically bankrupt already and getting worse. So why are we so concerned? Well, in Germany in 1920, they had some significant inflation. My grandparents sold a restaurant that, to retire. When it went into escrow, it was enough to retire on. When it came out of escrow, what they received was enough to buy a loaf of bread. And that the food prices doubled every 49 hours. 
A loaf of bread in 1920 cost about, cost about a mark. 1923, it cost 720 million marks for a loaf of bread. Now, this is an extreme example, but it's what, that's what hyperinflation, that's what the term means. In Russia, in the 1990s, it had an equivalent situation. In 1994, it was about 100 rubles to the dollar. Within five years, it was 30,000 rubles to the dollar. Not as dramatic as, uh, as the collapse in Germany. Now, in the United States, we are now the lo- world's largest debtor. Out of a list of 163 nations, we're at the bottom of the list. What's even more disturbing, the next one above us, Spain, is we are nine times worse in terms of our negative net worth. And uh, 48 and oodles of zeros uh, debt instruments. Okay. That's why some people say it's the end of money. The, the, the money supply from 1620, Pilgrim time, to 1974, in 354 years, a trillion dollars of currency was enough to make things work. In 2006, in 10 months, they needed an additional trillion. And uh, the total credit market, of course, is just going... Is it, the point is, without going through all the numbers, it is simply the rate at which things are getting worse, it, the rate is increasing. You've got, an increase in you got an increased rate in the increasing rate. That's called exponentiation, actually. So it, there are some serious c- things coming. You've heard the uh, uh, talk about the Amero, a common currency to replace the U.S. dollar between the Canadian dollar and the Mexican peso and the U.S. dollar. And anyone that studied that says that's ridiculous. It'd take a, it would take a, a major crisis massive U.S. government debt, unbridled credit expansion, and the prospect of a major property uh, collapse. Except what struck me as I was pulling some of this together for one of our briefings, for the strategic briefings, I've always assumed that this was all a massive case of mismanagement for the Congress and, and the banks and what to allow us to get into this deep a hole is just utter mismanagement. But then when I looked at the government, looked at the trade deficit, and looked at the consumer situation, it hit me between the eyes. Doesn't mean I'm right, but I just wonder. You see, I noticed that Robert Pastor and the CFR, the architects of all this, have targeted the North American Union and the Amero for the year 2010. How interesting. I wonder if this crisis we're facing is the result of deliberate engineering by the globalists or what have you. It's, uh, it's, it, it's anyway, some people believe that. Well, okay, having said all that, let's get to the good news, all right? We heard uh, my friend Tim this morning talk about the, four, the classic four kingdoms. I thought, that's perfect. I want something to finish up tonight, and we'll talk about the fifth kingdom, okay? And we've had a lot of Issachar stuff. I think we've got to get back to the Berean track, okay? And so let's talk a little bit about the coming kingdom. In the Bible, Matthew 6, verse 10, is a very familiar verse to whether you know the reference or not. In the Lord's Prayer, we say what? Thy kingdom come. What on earth is that about? What do you mean, thy kingdom come? Well, he rules in our hearts. No, no. Thy kingdom's got to is, come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth, on earth as it is in earth. Is it yet? No, so there's something coming, right? Okay, nothing in heaven or earth is more certain than his kingdom coming. Are we together so far? I'm going to go down a path here that I won't have the time to defend. I want to highlight some things for you to check out and study on your own because some some of this is really solid. Some of it may lead to some conjectures. And you've got to sort that through. Let's start a little bit with some perception issues. There's a term in optics called resolving power. You can look through a cheap telescope at the sky and see a star. No problem. You go and replace that with a very expensive telescope and you discover that that star is actually a double star. There are mathematical formulas that will determine what the resolving power of the optics are. The more resolving power, the better they are, the more they can resolve fine, fine issues. That term also can apply to hermeneutics. And, and that's how we developed our details on the Olivet Discourse. 
because Matthew 24 and Mark 13 are the same presentation. Luke 21 is not. It's very similar, but it's astonishingly different. And once you understand the differences, it dissolves most of the controversies that the preterists like to use to confuse people. But let's, let's stay on the subject here. There are two terms in the scripture, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Virtually every commentary that you'll consult on this... Oh, by the way, only Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven. Mark, Luke, and John use kingdom of God. And most commentators assume they're synonyms. Matthew, because of his Jewishness or whatever, chooses kingdom of uh, heaven. Except there's a problem with that. And uh, are they the same or not? How do they overlap? What's the whole story here? You know, the whole idea, we're instructed to rightly divide the truth, right? Okay? The kingdom of God is sort of an easy one. Everything that's outside of God himself is his kingdom. That's beyond visibility. It includes the angels, not just the earth and all of that, the cherry bin and all that. It began before the earth because the angels jumped for joy when he made the earth, right? And so it's inclusive. That term is inclusive of all of God's creation. No problem there because of its, of its expansiveness. The kingdom of heaven is a bit of a problem because it's physical and has locality. It's got a capital, Jerusalem. Okay? And it deals with mankind on the earth. It, it, it has a political institution. It's a political institution. I'll show you that. And it has a capital. And it was usurped and it's destined to be regained, according to Matthew eleven twelve. So we begin to suspect that whatever the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of heaven is some kind of definitive subset of that. And that is, in, there's 739 references to heaven, but only Matthew uses kingdom of heaven. He does it 33 times. Nobody else uses that term. Well, he always uses that. No, he doesn't. Five times he uses kingdom of God. In fact, in one case, he uses them adjacent to each other. And I've actually had a commentary say, well, that proves they're synonyms. No, it does. It proves the opposite. He is making a denotative distinction between one and the other. You with me so far? Careful, we're going down a treacherous road here, okay? Kingdom of God. That began when God created anything outside himself. Before the angels, the universe, the earth was created. It obviously embraces all of that. It's beyond locality. It's everything. Outside time. It's, it's not just lots of time. It's outside time. It's eternal. It's incapable of dissolution. But in Daniel 2.44 is just one example, but it's a crisp one because we've had allusion to it earlier today. In Daniel chapter 2, where Daniel has, he's seeing this vision, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, so forth. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The context are these earthly kingdoms. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. But it's, as they get destroyed, God sets up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and subdue these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So it's a kingdom that's tangible. This isn't some kind of metaphorical. This is a tangible kingdom. The... Uh, Shock for me, as I started, and I'm indebted here, let me say right up front, my wife has gone through more than 50 books to research this and some related topics, and I'm incredibly indebted, indebted to insights that has emerged from that research. And one of the things that surfaced that startled me, because I hadn't appreciated it, I have been, I've been teaching about the millennium for many decades. The millennium is, I believe, literal. I'm pre-millennial, not amillennial. I also have taught for years the unconditional covenants, Abrahamic covenant, the land covenant, the Davidic covenant, the everlasting covenant. The Davidic covenant is not unconditional. I was stunned to realize the obvious. I never realized that the millennium is simply the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. But as you begin to put, paint it in those terms, it raises the fog on all kinds of other issues. In 2 Samuel 7, we have the covenant to David, of the seed of David according to the flesh. Romans, uh, Book of Romans even emphasized that. It's a promise of posterity in the Davidic house, 
It's a throne of royal authority. It's a kingdom rule on the earth. Both Sol- David and Solomon understood it to be an earthly kingdom. And it had certainty. It is established forever. Solomon had his birth predicted, but he was not promised a perpetual seed. The throne, yes, his seed, no. Very subtle difference. It's astonishing. When you're studying prophecy, be precise. We've had several ad- uh, admonitions to that. Uh, Walid made that point very eloquently here in the last hour. It, 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 his kingdom would be established. His throne, uh, his enthr- Solomon's throne, the Davidic throne, would endure forever, but not his seed. If he sinned, he'd be chastised, but not deposed. It's the throne, not the seed, that was perpetual as far as that covenant concerned. Israel has had nine dynasties. That's the northern house, that is. The southern house had one, the Davidic house. And Christ was born of Mary, who was not of Solomon's line. It was of Nathan's line. Luke makes that distinction. The throne, but not the seed, passed through Solomon. And uh, the Davidic covenant, given by oath by the Lord and confirmed to Mary by Gabriel, is is of David's throne. It has yet to be given to the throne-crowned one. Because David's throne did not exist during Christ's ministry. And uh, both David and Solomon understood this promise to be for an earthly kingdom. The scepter of Judah was promised to the tribe of Judah. uh, David's promised kingdom was a political kingdom. Uh, That is, his house, his dynasty, a royal line, and so forth. This was even emphasized to Abraham back in Genesis 17, ever for him. It was prophesied in advance. In Genesis 38... Encrypted in Genesis 38 in 49 letter intervals is Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, or Yishe, and David. 49 letter intervals in chronological order, encrypted in the Torah, in a genealogy, in the book of Moses, long before Joshua, Judges, and Samuel. Fascinating. Of course, in the book of Ruth, it's also. So David was, this was established by God long before Saul and all that business, okay? Confirmed by oath in Psalm 132, 89, and several other places. Of course, Solomon's sons fail. That's what leads to the curse on Jeconiah and so forth. Blood curse on his line in Jeremiah 22, 30. Most of the regulars are familiar with all of that. And so Jesus has a legal line through Joseph, but he has a blood claim through Mary. So he has both. And that's really part of what the daughters of Zelophehad, exception of the Torah, is all about. We have studies on that you're probably familiar with. But the main point is David's throne didn't exist during Christ's ministry. So is this allegory or is this, is this literal? I believe it's literal. So the Davidic covenant, declared to be everlasting all through the scripture, confirmed by Mary to Gabriel, recognized by the first church council in Acts 15, James to resolve this issue, what does a Gentile have to do to be saved, quotes Amos 9 verse 11, which deals with the reestablishment of David's, the tabernacle of David as he puts it. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, what are we praying for? The millennium, yes. The fulfillment of the promise to David, the Davidic kingdom. Of course, one of the titles of Christ is, of course, the root of David. Incidentally, I've always assumed in in Ezekiel and Hosea, when it says that David will rule to the millennium, I've always sort of figured, well, it's just an idiom for the son of David. Well, it may be. Many good scholars think so. But four times it says David is going to rule. He's going to be resurrected, right? So why not? Interesting. So it's interesting to me to also stand back and get a little different perspective. There are 12 tribes. How many knew that? I want to see if you're still with me. Okay, 12 tribes, right? Okay. And there are 12 apostles to rule on what? 12 thrones over the 12 tribes. We have 12 kingdom parables. I've always thought there were seven because there's seven in Matthew 13. Whoops, there's five more. So there's 12 tribes, 12 apostles, 12 kingdom uh, parables. There's 12 kingdom mysteries. There's 12,000 sealed of 12 different tribes in Revelation. And, of course, we have in the New Jerusalem 12 gates, 12 foundation stones, 12,000 furlongs cubed, etc., etc. So suddenly, while seven is a completion when you talk about the kingdom of God, seven churches and that sort of thing, it's interesting that when you're talking kingdom, everything's in twelves. See, the Jewishness of it is showing up here. Now, we have a strange problem because our link to all of this is through the kingdom of God. And yet, we're participants in both in that sense. Are you together so far? Okay. Let's look a little further. Let's set aside another issue. Now, I may part company with some of you. may part company with, 
me on this one, but I'd like to establish a doctrinal point before we go further, and that has to do with eternal security. Now, we've got a lot of white knuckles now. We're going to get into that. Yeah. And I'm, I could go through a whole, obviously, a whole study on that. I'll take just a couple of verses. Jesus says in John 10, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's Jesus talking with his hand, right? My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Notice there's two hands involved. I always visualize it like this. Can I get out? Can I, could I get out of there if I tried? I don't think so. But I can say we have out of my hand or out of my Father's hand. If you can lose, if you have your salvation and you can lose it, I've got a new name for God. Butterfingers. <laughs> That's the kind of remark that I, I, I attribute to Walter Martin. I actually got it from another friend of mine, but it sounds so much like Walter, I'll blame him for it. A little irreverent, perhaps, but you immediately get the point. In John 17, Jesus passes that responsibility to the Father. So that has to do with understanding. When we start talking about eternal security, we start stumbling because we fumble the word, of sal- the word salvation. I love the way Earl Rademacher always joins us each December. He'll usually come in and he'll say, I'm saved, I'm being saved, and, I'm go- and I will be saved. And what he's, the point he's trying to make is that salvation has three tenses. He's saved in the past. That's called justification. Well, let's go through it. He's got... The past tense of salvation is justification. That's a gift from God that Christ did 100% of. You can't add to it. To try to add to it is blasphemy. We trust in Christ alone. How many agree with that? Okay, we're, a lot of us are on common ground here. Okay, that's good. I'm going to call that justification. That is, in a sense, past tense. When you trust Christ, your passport to heaven is stamped. You haven't changed at all, but you are declared innocent. Christ paid for that. The present tense of salvation is sancti- we call sanctification. That's a, that's a work. I don't know about you, but I'm a work in progress. Okay, I know I, I'm saved because Christ paid for that. That's justification. But the good news is he ain't through with me yet. He's still working the problem. Okay. The ultimate goal is glorification. That's the future tense. We've got past, present, future. And that's a result of all that went previously. All believers, according to Romans 8, are going to go through all three, by the way. And that's a big surprise, but that's a whole other issue. Past tense is separation from the penalty of sin. Present tense is separation from the power of sin. Thanks to Romans 6, you and I can declare that sin ain't going to reign no more. You may stumble, but you need not because you can, if you're walking by the Spirit, you have power over sin. Future tense is separation from the presence of sin. So we've got past, present, and future separating you from the penalty, the power, or the presence of sin. So having said all that, one of the clues I can give you, when you go through the book of Hebrews, it's written to believers. Justification is past tense. It's behind them. The writer to Hebrews includes himself. We this and us that. So whatever their condition is, he shares it. I happen to believe it's Paul, but I'm not going to, that, that's not an issue for tonight. Let's move on. Past tense, justification, present tense, sanctification, future tense, glorification. Now, why am I getting into these things? These are the three tenses. We encourage our students not to use the word salvation because that's ambiguous in a critical way. Gee, I was saved from a burning building last week. Or I was saved from drowning three months ago. So you can be saved from lots of things. We're assuming soteriological salvation, separation from the, the, the threat of hell. Okay, but that's got th- that process really has three tenses. And so we encourage people to use the specific thing that's relevant because it'll, be a much, it'll you'll avoid a lot of problems. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares the sinner righteous. Sanctification makes the sinner righteous. Sancti- uh, uh, justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin. Sanctification removes the growth and power of sin. Okay. Let's get to, there's been a war going on doctrinally between the Calvinists and Arminius. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I suspect if I said, how many of you are Calvinists? I'd get a large, large, large number of hands. Don't bother right now. I'd say, how many of you are Arminian? I'd get another bunch of hands. And you'll find those. And I'm going to be very, 
summary here. I'm being un, a little bit unfair to both sides, but I think the summary is reasonably valid. A five-point Calvinist, the five main points, are usually, uh, well, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And many Calvinists are not five-point, they're three-point or two-point. I'm not going to get down to that. They usually, you, you can use as an acronym TULIP for the T-U-L-I-P. That's, we're not going to go down that path. The critical issue for Calvinists is that all they believe that you're predestined to be saved and all true believers will persevere to the end. Well, that leaves you with a little problem. How do you know if you're saved? Well, you have to wait to the end and find out, you see, because perseverance is a final test of reality. Have you been saved? I think so. I'm a Calvinist. You know, I, I, I've been predestined. Well, d- how do you know you're saved? Well, because I'll persevere to the end. Well, wait a minute. What happens if you don't persevere? Yet? Well, then you weren't saved in the first place. You, you, you get into those issues, okay? So this is some, why some authors call this view experimental predestinarians. You're predestinated, but you don't really know until you get to the end to find out that you were. With me? You see the difficulty. Okay. Now, this effectively denies assurance of salvation because proof is always in the future. See the difficulty. The Arminian has a little different situation. He believes that their justification can be lost. Well, there's huge problems with that, but that's basically the position they take. They believe that believers are in danger of losing their salvation as a result of sinful behavior, and they use that as, as their motivation, not to sin, right? It gives you a real problem when you do, because you will stumble. To the Arminian, the believer's eternal security rests in Christ's work, of course, and the individual's decision to continue in faith and not fall away. Works play a key role in retaining salvation to the Arminian. Are we together so far? So we have both these views acknowledge Christ's completed work is essential. Both acknowledge the, of, of the importance of works to the believer. So in that sense, they're both not only they very similar, they're dangerously close to the Roman Catholic view of salvation by works. The distinctions get, become increasingly trivial. So we have the Calvinists, eternal security, perseverance, so forth, and we have the Arminians. For hundreds of years, these two theological schools have butted heads because their failure to define the precision of what they mean when they talk about salvation. And there is a third view that we want to at least make you aware of, and that's the overcomers. These are those who know they are secure and can't lose their salvation because they're talking about justification. But they do make a distinction between entering heaven and inheriting it. If I invite you to my home, that gives you access. Doesn't give you the right to rearrange the furniture. Many of you here have have appropriate permission to enter this resort hotel. Unless there's a relative of Hagedon here, I don't think there's any of us that say we've inherited it. You see what I'm saying? There's a difference between entering and inheriting. In other words, there's a variation of the rewards at the, at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, Paul's an interesting guy. Paul wrote the book on eternal security. Romans 8, you can, you can just make deluge of verses that nail beyond uh, uh, dispute that justification is by faith alone. Paul wrote the book. And yet, Paul was a paranoid. He lived his life almost in panic. Example, 1 Corinthians 9.27, I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. What does Paul mean? Is he afraid of losing his salvation? I don't think so. But he's certainly concerned about something. And I believe what he's concerned about is his inheritance. So what you need to do is do a study of inheritance, and you'll discover something interesting. In the Old Testament, inheritance was something you had to be faithful to gain. You could forfeit it. Esau is the best example. There are dozens of others. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews leans heavily on the wilderness experience as a model for us. And the point that's made there. Let me paraphrase it slightly. Over a million people were saved out of Egypt, and only two inherited it. 
Joshua and Caleb. Moses wasn't one of them. Whoa, we better understand what's going on. New Testament. You discover that inheritance can be lost. We have the prodigal son. A friend of mine pointed out the prodigal son spent half his inheritance on wine, women, and song, and he wasted the other half. <laughs> but no, seriously, what's interesting is he lost his inheritance, of course, but he never lost his sonship. There's some distinct. See, there's parts of your inheritance you can't lose. There are parts that you can. That's really the point. Okay. Paul, I can be a castaway. So this is different between entering and inheriting. An invitation to my home allows you to enter but not inherit it. You can enter this hotel, but it doesn't mean you inherit it. Inheritances or privileges will be widely variable. We all talk about the rapture of the church, the harpazo, right? Great. And we usually, in our little charts and stuff, we talk about what happens on the earth. Okay, there are hypotheses, and then there's a seven-year enforcement of a covenant. In the middle of that, we have the abomination of desolation. The last three and a half years are the, the, uh, the uh, great tribulation. Jesus himself labels the last three and a half years as the great tribulation. And then we have Armageddon, and it's interrupted by the second coming. We all make those little charts. Great. That's on the earth. What's going on in heaven? Harpazo is taking place. He hasn't come back yet. What's going on up there? At least two major things. At least two major things. There's a thing called the judgment seat of Christ. Ooh. Ooh. Where we all are going to stand. And by the way, everybody before that judgment seat is saved. Or they wouldn't be there. There is a concept in Hebrews 3.14, for example, it says, for, speaking of us, we are made partakers of Christ if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence, steadfast unto the end. There's some aspect of our relationship with Christ that requires our continuance, our commitment. Being a partaker. The Greek term is metakoi. That's being the ultimate koinonos, in a sense. Being a partaker. That's a term that means someone who shares in, that is a partner in a work or an office or a dignity. And that's if... It's a big if there. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, there is a value in continuing. If you're saved and can't lose your salvation, okay. You may be in... See, I, I was going to make the opening of this discussion making the following statement. I personally believe that most people that get to heaven are going to be disappointed. That's a good way to get the attention of an audience, Right? Most people get to heaven are going to be disappointed. Why? Because they've been mistaught. All of us have been taught, well, if you're in Christ, you're going to reign and rule with him. That's not what it says. If so be that, there's always fine print. You need to understand that. Let's take a look at Revelation 23 as an example. Behold, I come quickly, he says. Hold fast. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about a crown. There's at least five of them, maybe others, that are listed. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. Okay, no man take thy crown. Is, are, is your crown in danger? Is your inheritance in danger? We have all kinds of promises to the overcomer. And I want to tell, one reason I wanted to get in this night, now I wanted to stir up some more, you're a sophisticated audience, get, stir, stir up some serious discussion, you know, as you go from this conference. But I'm also trying to repair, in, my, in a small way, a myopic uh, presentation on my own part. Because I, when I get, when, go through Revelation, I hide behind 1 John 5, 5. Who is he that overcometh, but he that Jesus believed that uh, Christ is the Son of God? And because of that, I present but don't redevelop the overcomers. And I begin, I, I, I begin to realize that that is an illegitimate connotative transfer. Now, what do I mean by an illegitimate connotative? Let me give you an example of a deliberate connotative transfer. I've been kidding several people in the, in the group of the technicals. Is What's a kilobyte? Well, a thousand bytes. So what's, a gig, what's a gigabyte? A thousand kilobytes. Great. What's a moabyte? And they look at me straight, and I says, it's a lot. <laughs> see? You see? Well, 
That's a silly, corny little pun. See, that's what we call a pun, right? Except, see, the Holy Spirit does deal in puns. First, first Corinthians 10.4, the rock that followed in the wilderness was Christ. He's using a metaphorical pun. But, so a, a deliberate connotative transfer is what we would casually call a pun. An illegitimate connotative transfer is a logical error. And if I say to you that I live in Idaho and I live in the United States, you can't conclude from that that people who live in the United States live in Idaho. And that's what we do with that verse in 1 John 5.5. 5. Because the overcomer believes that Christ is the Son of God doesn't mean that that's all it takes. You see? And that opens a whole can of peas that I've got to repair. Because many of my materials fail to make that discernment. So one of the lessons of all this is I'm on a learning curve too. And the best I can do is repair it as quickly and as thoroughly as I can. But the overcomer, and I'm not going to go through all these, but the overcomers get to eat of the tree of life. They're not hurt of the second death. There's a hidden manna thing with a white stone and what have you. They have power over the nations. Not everybody, the overcomers. Not, every, not everybody's saved by power over the nations. There are two kinds of people in the kingdom, subjects and sovereigns. Okay? White raiment, is assured, white raiment is assured to the overcomer. White raiment is assured to the overcomer. That's a whole study behind that one. Pillar new name, sit down with Christ on his throne. Everybody know the very, very favored ones. We all have been taught the Bema seat of Christ, right? Well, Bema was the judgment place where they, 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 they uh, gave out athletic awards. I have said that in my studies because that's what I was taught, and that's a bunch of baloney. Pilate judged Christ from a Bema seat. Festus, Agrippa, they did their thing from the Bema seat. It's a judgment seat. Now, the concept that's usually taught is correct. At the Bema seat, there's no one being judged negatively. They're all saved. They're given rewards, but losing theirs to get zero, you see. Not negative, just zero. You with me? So in that sense, it's, everything's on the positive. You go through that and not lose, okay, okay. But we'll all stand there and we're going to be judged. Our works are going to be judged. Our faithfulness is going to be judged. Anyway, the overcomers are going to inherit all things according to Revelation 21.7. So the events following the Arpazzo, on the earth, of course, there's the, the emergence of the world leaders, the great tribulation, the campaign of Armageddon, all that sort of stuff. In heaven, we have the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage of the Lamb. We have the bride of Christ, right? One of the questions I'm going to leave you with is something I'm still researching. I'm not firm on this, but a, a, a veil is lifted for me at least. Of course, after all this, by the way, we have the second coming of Christ, of course, and the Davidic kingdom is established on the earth. Now, as we look at the sick, you have the Harpazo, and there's some, di- there's some distance, it might be zero, but it's something maybe between the Harpazo and the enforcement of the... Because after the Harpazo the, is when the Antichrist is revealed, and he gets to power, when he gets to power, he enforces the covenant. There's some kind of possible delay there. And, of course, we have the 70th week of Daniel. Up in heaven, we have the Bema seat, apparently the next step, and we have the marriage of the Lamb, whatever that, whatever that turns out to really mean. Down on the earth, we have the abomination of desolation, and we have it split this, in the two halves, the, the seven-year period. And we have, of course, the, the, la- the place that Jesus himself labels the Great Tribulation. That is the, it's three and a half years, not seven. It's the last half. And, that, of course, that is climaxed with the Armageddon and the second coming of Christ. What does he do when he gets to the earth? Well, he establishes his kingdom. For what? Thousand years, sort of, forever, but there's a thousand-year period that's distinctive. So that's a little trick question, and I won't put that on the final. Okay. Um, <laughs> then we have this strange thing called sheep and goats, and that's a study in its own right, and the marriage supper, and I'm still researching this, but the experts are suggesting to me that the marriage of the Lamb and the, marriage, the wedding feast are two different things. The marriage of the Lamb occurs in the Father's house, because he says so at the Last Supper when he promises when he doesn't take the fourth cup, he's going to take the fourth cup in, the, in his father's house. At the same time, the wedding feast is a celebration when he's established his kingdom. So they're apparently separated by that aspect to it. And there's all kinds of, if that's correct, there's all kinds of clarification on the so-called problem parables. But after a thousand years, we have the great white throne. It's a whole different judgment. And you, yet most of you have studied that separately. We have the new heaven and the new earth, and, and on it goes. And then out of that comes this bizarre interconnect between the third heaven and the earth with the new Jerusalem and so on. And uh, the question I have for you to think about is the bride of Christ and the body of Christ the same thing? 
If we're all saved, we're in the body of Christ, right? Are we in the bride of Christ? I'm not so sure. The bride of, you know, it's interesting, brides, you study brides in Scripture, the bride is taken out of the body. Eve was taken out of Adam. When Abraham commissions Eliezer to get a bride for Isaac, he insists that he take her out of their people. And on it goes. It's also interesting when you study these passages, the bride is always arrayed in her own raiment. We always assume it's imputed. It doesn't say that. There are 12 areas of judgment at the judgment seat of Christ, at least. How we treat other believers, how we exercise authority over others, how we employ our God-given abilities, how we use our money, how we spend our time, how much we suffer for Jesus. These are all plenty of references, Old and New Testament, on these issues. How we run the particular race that God has given us. How effectively we control our old nature. How many souls we witness to and win Christ. How we react to temptation. How much the doctrine of the rapture means to us. We're measured on what the doctrine of the rapture means to us. That surprised me. In 2 Timothy 4, 8 and 9, for example. How faithful we are to the word of God. and the flock. These are just statements. Happen to be 12 of them. I thought, I thought that was interesting. Of issues that we'll be facing when we're going to our final exam. Okay? I want to give you some caveats before I tie this off. As you do this, don't get in the flesh. What counts is what's done for him through the Holy Spirit. And I, but we, we've seen guys who write on this and give you the list of how to, how to make it by the exam. It's all the wrong things, you know. It's, it's do this, do this, do this. It's as if you have a ritual. It's as if you, no, 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 you missed the point. Don't get under a work strip. That's expressly taught against. Don't, you're not under the law. And that, that, you know, there's amazing, the Messianics often get really caught up in this, especially Christians. They get caught up with the Jewish of the Old Testament. They learn about the Feast of Moses, and that's all good. Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning. That we, through the comfort of the Scriptures, might have, have hope. That's all great, except realize the book of Galatians is in your Bible. Check it. I think it's still there. Okay? And the book of Hebrews is the real illuminating one on this. But the Messiah is the fulfillment of the Torah for you and I. Avoid a works trip. That's, 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 uh, that's a trap. That's exactly what he came to free us from. That's what the uh, walk by the Spirit, not the flesh. Gal- the book of Galatians hammers that. Of course, sin is not to reign anymore. That's because you can call upon the Holy Spirit to be your guide there. And walking with God. That means you w- don't walk ahead and you don't fall behind, right? So that's a quick end of it. One, one last thing I've got to throw in here just to give you. Several people ask me to use the... Uh, uh, coming king thing that I often use as a wrap-up. You people are so regular, you're probably tired of me using that one. I want to steal something from Joe Foch that I just, may, I think fits the occasion here. And It's what I happen to call a chain of gold. There was a guy, a nobody, by the name of Edward Kimball. And he had a burden for one of his Sunday school stu- students to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So he went down to the shoe store where he worked and led him to Christ in the shoe store. And his name was Dwight Moody. That young man went on to become an evangelist whose ministry rocked two continents. Well, when he was in the British Isles, he spoke in a small chapel that was pastored by a guy by the name of Frederick Brother and Meyer. In his sermon, Moody told the emotionally charged story of a Sunday school teacher who knew that he personally went to every student in his class and won him to Christ. And that story so moved Meyer that he changed his whole ministry to become an evangelist. And he came to America. Meyer then comes back to America to preach. In Northfield, Massachusetts, a confused young preacher sitting on the back row heard Meyer say, if you're not willing to give everything to God, are you willing to be made willing? (laughs) <laughs> That's an interesting question. And that convicted him. That remark led J. Wilbur Chapman to accept the call of God in his life. Well, Chapman went on to become one of the most effective evangelists of his time. There was a volunteer that helped set up Chapman's crusades, and he learned how to preach by watching him. His name, Billy Sunday. Sunday eventually took over Chapman's ministry, becoming one of the most effective evangelists in the 20th century. Greater arenas of the nation. Uh, uh, in those arenas, he, he brought thousands to Christ. Inspired by a 1924 Billy Sunday crusade in Charlotte, 
a committee of Christians committed themselves to reaching the city for Christ, and they invite a guy by the name Mordecai Ham and, uh, to hold a series of evangelistic meetings in 1932. And there's a lanky old six, a 16-year-old in the huge crowd one evening. And he was spellbound by this white-haired preacher who seemed to be shouting and waving his long finger directly at him. And night after night, the youth attended and finally went forward and gave his life to Christ. What was his name? Billy Graham. A nobody by the name of Kimball. That a person of Christ. Then another, that led to that, led to that, led to that, led to a chain, what I call a chain of gold. Can anything like that happen today? You see, one of the things that I'm really enamored with is a little Jewish proverb I came across from one of the rabbis. They say, if you save a life, you save a nation. It gets it across. I'm out of gas. I hope that this conference has caused you to do several things. Well, number one is raise the bar in your own ministry, your own calling, whatever that might be. Because hopefully you're saved. I'm, I'm, I've operated on the presumption that you have accepted our Lord Jesus Christ. But many of us have been lulled into complacency by the comfort that our justification is irrevocable, and it is. But that has got nothing. Let me ask another way. How many of you are saved? Can I see your hands? My next question is, what have you done with it? What has God called you to do? The greatest adventure in life is to find out what God called you to do. I spent 30 years running public companies, CEO of six of them. Four of those were defense contractors. I had a ball in high technology. It was Hal Lindsey's recruiting me to the full-time ministry that changed my life. I've never worked harder, never been happier. And if you hear my tapes for those 25 years earlier and hear mine now, you can see the difference. One was head knowledge and one was for real, if you will. Every one of us should try to find out, that's the great one, what God's called you to do. And get with it. We're not all about nuclear weapons or we have stewardship issues that hopefully this will be helpful. But at the same time, we have the greatest opportunity for the kingdom in our lifetimes coming up ahead. And we've got a chance. You see, you, all of us hope the rapture will be soon. But every day that he tarries is a day that we have to repair our report card to get about his business. And the opportunities that are ahead of us are gigantic in contrast to those of the past. So I leave it to you.